Operations and Revenue Committee to hear some very important reports that we had requested in last year's state budget bill, uh, being as we in essence have two, two meetings at the same time, one House, one Senate just happened to be in the same room, um, unless the Parks and State Fair Board object and would like to make this presentation twice, in which case we can split it up, or we can just call roll for both of them. So I'll go with call the roll portion. Madam Secretary, call the roll for the Senate, please. Senator Boswell. Here. Senator Deneen. Senator Douglas. Senator Funky Frohmeyer. Present. Senator Givens. Here. Senator Neal. Senator Nemes. Present. Senator Webb. Vice Chair Bledsoe. Here. Chair McDaniel. Here. All right, having a quorum, we're duly constituted to conduct business. Co-Chair Petrie. And we will call to order the meeting of the House Appropriations and Revenue. And if you will call the order for the House, please. Representative Banta. Here. Representative Bentley. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bowling. Here. Representative Branscombe. Here. Representative Bray. Here. Representative Brown. Here. Representative Dossett. Present. Representative Flannery. Representative Fleming. Here. Representative Frazier Gordon. Here. Representative Freeland. Representative Fugit. Here. Representative Gentry. Representative Hart. Representative Johnson. Here. Representative McCool. Representative McPherson. Here. Representative Palumbo. Representative Raymond. Here. Representative Riley. Representative Stevenson. Here. Representative Upchurch. Here. Vice Chair Reed. Chair Petrie. Here. All right, very well. Um, See Dr. Douglas, Senator Boswell here. In case we didn't get them earlier. All right, this time, could we have representatives of the State Fair Board come to the table, please? All right, gentlemen, just quickly by way of housekeeping, when you get started, please introduce yourselves for the record. Then you're going to have a half a total total of a half an hour for this presentation. I'd like to ask we keep your uh, comments to 20 minutes or less, and then uh, leave us about 10 minutes for questions and answers, please. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll get started. I'm uh, Dr. Mark Lynn. I'm the chair, of Kentucky Fair Board. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. I'm David Wallace. I'm vice chairman of the Kentucky State Fair Board and chairman of the P3 committee. Mr. Beck, would you please push the uh, button on the front of your mic till the green light comes on? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to, we've introduced ourselves and I want to thank uh, both committees for allowing us to be here today and thank the legislature for the uh, appropriation that you made last year uh, for the Kentucky State Fair Board and uh, for the Expo Center and, uh, and our, all of our properties. Um, first, I would sort of give you an, an overview of the history of the, uh, of the Kentucky State Fairgrounds. And I think everyone should have received uh, our packet that, uh, that you have of the study that we have performed. You know, the Kentucky State Fairgrounds is, is an icon of the Commonwealth of Kentucky and also of the nation. In 19, it was first start, construction began in 1950, and it was opened in 1956 with the East Wing, West Wing, and Freedom Hall. That uh, facility at the time was one of the largest uh, indoor facilities in the United States. Uh, then uh, took about 40 years up until uh, night, or, I'm sorry, 20 years before there were any further expansions done. We had the East Hall and the West Hall that were done. 1977, we built Broadbent Arena. And 2003, we did South Wing C. And in 2006, we did the North Wing. So it's been since 2006 since we've had any major renovations to our facilities. What we see is our biggest issues is beginning to stay relevant with our competitive set. When we look at the other facilities throughout the United States that we compete with, especially in our livestock and equestrian events, we need to, we feel like we need to step that up. What we have is we have West Wing, 
I think many of you have been there familiar with it. if you've been there during the state fair that's where all of our animals are west wing is the last original part of the kentucky state fairgrounds it was built in 1956 it's got short ceilings it's got a lot of columns so we are limited into what we can use that facility for. It's primarily, again, livestock. If you were there last week, uh, maybe during the National Farm Machinery Show, you can see we do use it for vendors for that. But uh, it's, uh, it's limited use. So when we are doing volleyball and basketball, we have volleyball we have, uh, we'll have 120 courts in South Wing. We could expand that if we had higher ceilings and better facilities to maximize uh, our use <coughs> of the property. So when we started looking at a master plan, what we did is we, we looked at the shortfalls that we have on the West Wing and how can we best uh, take care of that problem going forward. And basically what we're looking to do is to increase the net revenue per square foot of our facility. If we can still maintain the priority of any new facility that we construct to be equestrian and livestock, so it would have all of the facilities that we need in there, wash racks, but also have the tall ceilings like we do in South Wing C, <coughs> and North Wing, then we can also use those for other events, for trade shows, for conventions, uh, and for all of our sporting events that we have on the property. So that's really what we're trying to get to. Uh, the other priority when we were looking at this was to have as least of impact as we can on our existing events and design any construction where we will not interrupt events that we have. When I start looking at the events that we have at our facilities, in addition to the, one, the ones that we produce, the Kentucky State Fair, North American Livestock Expo, and the Farm Machinery Show. By the way, <coughs> last week we had well over 300,000 people in four days at the National Farm Machinery Show. We believe we're still getting the numbers together that we have set some records uh, for that for this year. It's amazing that coming back from COVID where we're at, but it's, uh, it's a big economic boost for the Commonwealth and for the Jefferson County area. But the events that we, we want to make sure that, that we have there, some of you I'm sure have been some of those, Utility Expo, uh, GIE, the uh, street rods, the, uh, track, uh, the truck shows, those are the ones that we took and we did a layout of all of our property. We have about 450 to 500 acres on the property. We have 23,000 parking spots. But we are one of the few facilities where we utilize those outdoor for some of our biggest trade shows. So we have to do an overlay of each of those shows. We did that in the study that you will see that you have a copy of that shows exactly where we can, where we believe that we can do expansion and not affect those existing shows and, and draw in others. This last year and for the past few years, we've also been uh, fortunate to have uh, the Danny Wimber <coughs> Presents uh, there at uh, the Kentucky State Fairgrounds on our festival grounds. For those of you that don't know, those last year and the year before were the largest music festivals in North America that were held on our property. That's some new business that came around in about 2017, 18, uh, that we that was able to bring in or to keep because there were some issues uh, in other areas that we get, were able to get it out to the fairgrounds and make sure that that stayed in the Jefferson County uh, area. And that's a pretty big economic drive for, for that. You know, what we, the, when we're doing our analysis, we, we look at how many square feet do we need? And one of the big things that we've noticed and our consultants have told us is a lot of what trade shows and conventions, they're looking for contiguous square footage. So everything all together. So right now we have about 497,000 square feet of contiguous.
contiguous footage, square footage. If you look at that south wing and add in north, uh, north wing and east hall. Um, to be, that puts us, oh, about middle of the pack of places in the United States. With the plan that, that has been presented to you for all three phases, we would be number two in the nation in contiguous square footage, giving us about 1.1 million uh, square feet of contiguous uh, space that can be used. Even if, we on, even if we only do phase one, and which we have taken each phase and they are, can be totally independent of each other and still have a, a very good operating facility, even if we only do phase one, we will still be in the top six in the United States as far as contiguous. We'd have about 771,000 square feet when we do that. You know, we look at uh, what, what our event people want. You know, one of the big things is, ho is hotel rooms. And if we look uh, within a mile radius of the Kentucky State Fairgrounds, we have about 2,500 hotel rooms. If we go down and pick up downtown area, uh, there's over 6,000 that, uh, that are available. So we, there's always gonna be a continued need uh, for, for more uh, development and more hotels. Um, we, we broke out uh, in our study, the different areas that we think that we need to focus upon, and that, again, that's highlighted within the materials that you have. One is uh, our core, what I'll say is our core business is the livestock and equestrian events. We actually surveyed each one of these industries to say, what do you want, what do you need, and would you be interested in coming to Louisville, Kentucky? And what we found out is there's a more than moderately strong interest in bringing in more livestock and equestrian events into Kentucky if we have those facilities that uh, are gonna compete with a Denver, who Denver is committed to about $1.1 billion renovation there. Kansas City is looking for renovations. Uh, Columbus, Ohio State Fair I know is in. Uh, planning stages right now for for those uh, kind of events so we know and we've been able to do those surveys that there is a, a need and a want that we can expand the uh, events that we have there at the state fair our state fair grounds but what do we have to do we have to develop the property smartly we have to have uh, other p3 opportunities around the property to provide restaurants and other activities. We were so fortunate to have Kentucky Kingdom there, which is unique uh, to, uh, to our facility uh, for sporting events, especially bringing in the youth, the youth events. Uh, really, the only other one uh, is Orange County that has something similar when you figure the ESPN zone and Disney. Now we, uh, we have the facilities there with Kentucky Kingdom and with new management there, things are going really well. Um, when I'm, the next area is obviously our trade show area, trade shows, conventions. We did the same study with them. We believe and they believe one of the biggest shortfalls at, at KEC is meeting space. Uh, the designs that you have, the concepts that you have before you would, in, would increase our meeting space significantly. Uh, when people come in for trade shows, they also want to bring in uh, different companies to bring in their customers and have seminars. Uh, and that is one of the things that we did just recently at the Farm Machinery Show. The third thing that you see, the, probably the biggest change to the property, uh, is the sports uh, side. We've been very lucky on youth sports and working with the Louisville Sports Commission and bringing in some pretty large events. Basically volleyball, basketball, some of you may not know, we have the largest uh, girls basketball tournament in the United States that happens in July. We'll have about 16,000 participants in that. We'll have 900 uh, college coaches that come to that event. We know that they that there's expansion possibilities. We have 80 courts set up going at once within in the South Wing. 
through our surveys that our consultants did, they, they have identified that that is an area that we can expand. We also do archery indoors. We do wrestling and we have USA Gymnastics that is just getting ready to be there this next month. So there's a lot of expansion, but the bigger expansion is flat fields is going outside on part of our property and building uh, flat fields for soccer and lacrosse uh, field hockey. And that is something that would help us fill in. And we, uh, to one of the better things about that is that is a great P3 opportunity. We've had, there's been preliminary uh, interest by many different parties about uh, entering into a P3 arrangement for that. Uh, and it's something that we believe that will drive more business to our property. And if those days that are off, or weekends that are off that we don't have as much that we can fill up uh, for those. We are proposing that we would have 12 full-size fields, which will then actually convert into 24 youth fields. Um, and we've done the market studies on that also. Uh, and again, you'll see in the study that there's moderately strong interest in doing that and uh, that's the right size. Uh, what what does this do to us? Well, it, any all of the expansion that we're doing, we're, we will eat up some of our parking. And if the worst case scenario is that we'll eat up about 3,700 square, 3,700 parking spots uh, from one of our events. <clears throat> we have additional properties on the other side of Phillips Lane that is used for the festival grounds where the Danny Wimmer, uh, Louder Than Life and Bourbon and Beyond, we believe we can utilize those better. And you will see in the plan here that we've allocated funds to put a tunnel under Phillips Lane for tram and pedestrian traffic that we could use those grounds over there for potentially more parking and for other facilities so people are not having to walk across Phillips Lane or that we don't have to shut it down during the Kentucky State Fair. Um, so that's, uh, and the, the other, we have been in touch with our partners, being with uh, Churchill Downs, University of Louisville, have had discussions with them. Uh, we are one of the few uh, centers in the United States that do not have, that we don't utilize off-site parking. And for our big, big events, we believe that there are some partnerships that can be had with U of L uh, and Churchill to do off-site parking and, and shuttle services for that. But parking is, is always an issue for us. If you, again, if you were there last week and saw the parking, uh, it was full which is uh, what we're, we are happy to see. Market research and return on uh, economic, uh, return on investment, I'll, I'll touch on those quickly. Um, our first phase that uh, for this, for the $180 million that, that we uh, was appropriated in the last budget, You'll see that uh, that is included uh, in your packet. That will get us uh, 322,000 additional square feet. Uh, some of it is for space that we need to relocate our maintenance department. Some of it is for additional trade show. It will increase our trade show footprint by about 150,000 square feet. And uh, the other is for a new kitchen facilities. Uh, if you look at the kitch kitchen facilities that we need when we have that many people on the grounds, it's, it, it is a significant, significant uh, issue. You'll see that our budget for that is for the first phase is $185 million. We do have some contingencies built into that. We feel pretty, we feel really good about those numbers because we used a company called Populous uh, to, to get our concepts. Populous is uh, one of the largest uh, engineering architectural firms that specializes in livestock and equestrian facilities and multi-purpose facilities. They've got the experience, they've sort of, they know where, where those are and where the cost, cost will come out. You'll also see that we go through phase two and phase three in our master plan. Uh, phase two is about is another $200 million. 
phase three is another two, a little over 200 million. One of the big things that we do want to do uh, in phase one and phase two is if you're coming down Interstate 65, you see the rear end of our property. It's one of the largest, you know, I-65 is one of the busiest interstates in the United States, and you see the rear end of our property. And why is that? It's because in 1956, I-65 wasn't there. And so here, what this plan will do and what you will see in our proposal is we will rewrap the back side of our property and it will start beginning looking like the, a front side it'll be aesthetically pleasing and it'll help draw people in when they see see that and they're traveling on i-65 it'll be a it will absolutely absolutely be great advertisement to bring people into our facilities david about three more minutes and then we're going to start q a absolutely last thing i'll touch on is the p3 opportunities we've had several discussions those are covered Part of, a, part of your mish, uh, mandate to us was that we needed to identify 50% uh, uh, of P3 opportunities of 180 million. You'll see that we've identified those. Number one is the, uh, the flat fields. That's about a $30 million P3 investment. Our partner next door, the Crown Plaza, which is on our property that is owned by the Kentucky State Fair Board and the Commonwealth. Uh, there's a $20 million expansion, uh, not, I'm sorry, uh, renovation, refreshing of that facility. Uh, there are, we believe and feel pretty confident that in the first phase of construction that there are some P3 opportunities with our mechanicals and our lighting that will be between, between 10 and $20 million. Uh, and probably the biggest one that we know that there's a significant interest is in a hotel facility actually on our property. For many, many years, we've talked about a 600-room hotel. And all the market studies come back and say you're not ready for a 600-room hotel. So we've tried to become realistic, and we believe that that number and the people that are in that business tell us the, new, the number is three to 400 rooms with expansion possibilities. That's a $90 million build uh, just by itself. So at this point, uh, Dr. Lynn, Mr. Beck and I are available for any questions you have. Uh, we're happy to answer them. Good deal. Um, so just real briefly, I wanted to talk about the finance side of it. Um, this is a, a great plan. It's detailed. I appreciate the phasing. But of course, the money appropriated gets us through phase one. Right. Um, and then you get into your P3 stuff. Now, when you talk about, I, I, sorry, I have a twofold question. When you get into the P3, are you assuming some kind of a, an upfront payment for a 30 year lease on the ground, or is this extended out over time? Just so that I understand how you've got that structured. And secondarily, even with those P3s, you have gaps to get to the end of phase three financially. Do you have an anticipated revenue stream to get through all three phases of this? Part of the solution on the P3, it was really hard to come up with because until we knew we had phase one going, it's, it's tough to confirm with any developers exactly how you're going to do your P3 on phase two. The goal was to try to get enough we could do part of phase one, phase two at the same time. In other words, try to get the flat fields going as soon as we can. It's the easiest construction, easiest build most likely to turn uh, operating revenue as fast as possible. So the operating revenue coming from the fields, we feel out of the 52 weeks a year, the flat fields will be used at least 30 to 36 weeks of those. That is a huge impact upon not just our, our area and what's going to be going on, but with the kingdom, the hotels, the, the whole area will benefit from it. So we're hoping to draw some of the money from that utilization, but as we have to do this and, and how it becomes to light, we, we to tell you that it's definitely in place, that's not. We're, we're still working with, we're talking to a lot of people. We also believe that as the flat fields and the P3 becomes easy with those, that's where the restaurants, uh, other buildings, other businesses are going to pop up all around. In the plan, as you see, and I don't remember the acreage off the top of my head, but in the middle of the flat fields, we left room for that type of development to be done. And that'll all be P3 inside the flat field. So restaurants, 
uh, retail sales, what what other things that can be done, those can all pop up at the same time. Is That's there, all immediate revenue. Is there, McDaniel, one of the things, too, is, is our cost savings that we'll be able to to have immediately once we get phase one done. For instance, you wouldn't think of it, but tar paper. When we put tar paper down for the livestock that they have to walk on so they don't slip, that number these days, when you figure – Buying it, getting it down, the labor, and disposing of it is about a million dollars a year for us. So if we get something that has a, a floor, a non-slip floor, number one, we're going to be a lot more environmentally friendly, but we're also going to be a lot more budget friendly. When you gotcha. look, at, And then some of the P3 opportunities in the, the uh, mechanicals, those would also include maintenance contracts. So, so let's do this. We, we've got a few more questions to get through, sure. and I want to get to them. But over the next nine months or so, let's start building out how those inflows, outflows work. Absolutely. So we see how far we get and at what point from phase one to three we, we sure. begin to see a gap. All right, Senator Gibbons. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thanks for a great presentation. I had the chance to sit down in December when this packet landed on my desk and spent a little bit of time with it. And it's very, very well done. So compliments to you on the on the presentation. One of the questions I had from that December look through the packet, and you touched on it briefly, but I want you to go back to it and speak to it again because it's, it's very important. I see the opportunities, the excitement, and energy around the sports side. Those of us that are involved in the livestock world as well are, are wanting to know and be comforted that that's going to continue to be a priority. You said in your statement early that the focus was going to be livestock, but substantial growth into the sports area. It's got to be difficult to be both and. Tell me the wrestle that you had internally with that and, and offer some confidence to us that you can be both and. Right. Well, uh, first of all, we've, we've been both and for the history of our, the recent history of, the, of our fairgrounds. But I will tell you, number one priority for this new facility is livestock and equestrian. They will have first that is the first priority. We, we deal with it now, you know, Senator Givens, on any one weekend, we will have up to three events going at once there. Sometimes six. Sometimes six, uh, I'm told. And so we believe that we have enough space there to accommodate all of those. Uh, but the other thing that's going to happen, this is a concept plan that we're working with. Once we get through this process, we are going to get our equestrian friends with ASHA and livestock and we're going to have uh, some very good study committees meeting with us and our architects at that point to make sure that we are satisfying all those important portions. Great. One May quick follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Um, also, uh, and, and this was one of those I had to smile moments when I was looking through the packet in December and I'm so glad to have the chance to ask you publicly about this. Page 54, the boring tunnel concept <laughs> this is innovative, exciting. It may be a little too futuristic, but briefly speak to it because I'm intrigued. Yeah, go ahead. I'll mention that the study, the direction you gave us was to overall of our facilities, and that includes KIC as well as KEC. And uh, we have clients now centers using both properties and at the same time. And now we rely on buses and police escort, and hopefully there's not an accident on I-65 so we can get to people between the two properties. Uh, I've been in Louisville for a number of years, and the light rail has been discussed since I've been there. And they say if we start tomorrow, it'll be 8 to 10 years, $3.5 billion. This is doable in less than 24 months and uh, about 240 to $250 million. So it would be a way. We've had conversations with the airport, Churchill Downs, and uh, – uh, U of L and others about how we could help use that situation, but we're not looking for the state to pay for that. That would be another P3 opportunity to be managed and built and that type of thing. So it, it may not be the solution, but it talks about how important transportation is. We talk about direct flights into Louisville, but how do we move people around Louisville? How do we do that? And there's more than one company interested in that so they get their pencil sharp. The cost us to think about the future. What can we do to fully utilize both downtown, those hotels, as well as restaurants and hotels and others? Let's come up with a different name besides the Boring Tunnel, though. I <laughs> <laughs> understand. We'll All right, Senator that. Funky Frommeyer. Uh, thank you for this amazing presentation. This is uh, the first time I've seen this, but uh, having just spent a long weekend with over 100 volleyball teams in Indianapolis, <clears throat> Indiana, I love the idea that we can bring this to Kentucky. 
Um, but I do like the thoughts that you're sharing. And I, I'm not quite sure where I'm seeing the difference between um, the government running a hotel and a private interest running a hotel. Um, and we can talk about that more online, but I am so much more excited about experts bringing their expertise and not the government <coughs> running these entities. Sure. Thank you, Senator. And it, we already have that on our on our property right now. The Courtyard Marriott and the Crown Plaza and the Hilton Garden Inn are on our property. Long-term leases, we get lease payments. And uh, so that's it would be that kind of a, of a arrangement. All right. Very well. Well, gentlemen, you've uh, plowed through all the questions that we have up here. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Boswell. <clears throat> Last word. I'm sorry. I haven't had a chance to examine every portion of your uh, your uh, brochure yet. I just had a general question regarding revenue. Um, with the expansion that you're having, it obviously it's going to going to create additional revenue sources for different people. And my question is, uh, who receive who currently receives occupational net profit taxes for the entire operation? currently receives occupational net profit tax? Uh, as far as the city is concerned, we are exempt. Yeah. The state, Kentucky State Fair, by statute, Kentucky State Fair Board is exempt. Uh, what, what we are generating is about 69 percent of all hotel taxes are attributable to our property uh, for the, in the city of Louisville. Thank you. All right, very well. Uh, once again, would love to talk kind of through the the flow of finance over the next decade or so, see what we think we're looking at in, in all of this, or if you think it's a shorter time, that. But uh, wonderful presentation, very thorough, and uh, appreciate your attendance today, gentlemen. Yeah, we, we, had, we had looked at probably a, not 10 years, but we had actually broken it down a couple times in three-year segments to try to see where it goes so we can get that to you. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. At this time, we will have up the um, Department of Parks for your proposal for capital projects as well. So. Uh, if you guys would please come to the table, uh, identify yourselves for the record, and proceed. Good morning. I'm Lindy K. Spear, Secretary of the Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet. Russ Meyer, Commissioner of Kentucky State Parks. Ron Vanover, Deputy Commissioner <coughs> for Kentucky State Parks. morning uh, chairs and members of the committee we appreciate the opportunity to be here today before you as Kentucky State Parks reach beyond its 100 year history in the next decade and beyond it will be critical for us to update our parks infrastructure and equipment every resort park and many rec parks across the state operate much like small towns throughout Kentucky they have many of the same utility systems and maintenance requirements. They complement approximately 55 counties and multiple cities throughout the Commonwealth, providing jobs and unique opportunities for our guests. Our state parks not only serve as a popular tourist attraction, but have been instrumental in the state's emergency response efforts. As part of those efforts, Governor Bashir mobilized a total of 11 state parks as a community resource, providing emergency shelter and food services for displaced families and first responders. In Western Kentucky, our parks provided temporary housing to more than 800 individuals and 250 first responders. Over 360 citizens in Eastern Kentucky that were impacted by the flooding were also temporarily housed at the state parks. Our parks employees continue to work with local and state emergency management to actively transition impacted families into travel trailers into long-term housing solutions. Our state parks are a key driver for our $11.2 billion tourism industry, serving as a mechanism for not only bringing visitors to the Commonwealth, but for driving revenue to both rural and urban communities. It's my privilege to present Commissioner Meyer and Deputy Commissioner Van Over uh, to share our stewardship vision for the parks system in the coming days. Thank you, Secretary. And uh, Chair McDaniel, Chair Petrie, uh, Senators, Representatives, uh, thank you all very much for uh, um, allowing us the opportunity to be here today. Um, 
for considering us in House Bill 1 for the $150 million uh, proposed today. Um, it's been a long year, and uh, uh, we appreciate your all's time also for uh, um, giving us insight on, on the bill, um, how we proceed with our proposal, and uh, how we can uh, better Kentucky State Parks and the Commonwealth of Kentucky in this. Um, first, uh, um, Deputy Commissioner Ron Vanover, who I just want to say we're extremely proud to have uh, as Deputy Commissioner and on our team. Ron uh, uh, has been with, is a lifer in parks. He started in parks in the late eight, um, 80s and uh, has worked his way up to Deputy Commissioner um, through several administrations and uh, is just a, a huge asset, asset for parks and the Commonwealth. Um, as you know, um, what we're here to propose today is, is not, not new. Um, these are, are things and issues that have been in our capital uh, projects list for, for our six-year plan for, for many years. Um, the proposal we have together uh, today, it was put together by our team. I'm proud of our uh, team we have um, in Kentucky State Parks and the Tourism Cabinet. Um, they're all with us here today, and several of them could not make it today. Um, they're at the uh, Park Managers Conference that's going on and finishing up today at Barron River Lake. Um, our plan, um, we took a long look at this plan and how we put it together to uh, spend this money and, and propose it wisely, um, efficiently, um, through infrastructure needs, um, return on investment, which uh, includes not only revenue, but quality of life issues throughout uh, Kentucky State Parks. Um, with that said, I'm going to have Commissioner Vanover start us off uh, with the uh, presentation and the slideshow. Thank you. Thank you, committee members, for having us. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I think to understand Kentucky State Parks, you have to understand a little bit about its history. My family worked Sir, I don't Falls think your microphone ago. is on. I think in, for us to understand Kentucky history, especially with state parks, we understand a little bit about the person behind it. My grandfather worked at Cumberland Falls and he played the fiddle or tips way before it was a state park. Those things are still with me today. The fiddle, the place where the revenue of the monies he made, etc. It's something very warming to me. At the same time in the early 1920s, this gentleman, Dr. Willard Gilson, was hired by the legislature to go out and find parks that were worthy of state custodianship. He went east and west and north and south. He was a geologist, and you'll see he always carried his pick with him. He wanted to pick at Kentucky State Parks to make a jewel. So he was over in the Elkton region. He was over in the Eastern Kentucky region. And he came back and he wrote a little book that he put together before the legislature on July 1st, 1924. And this little book has set the standard for us for the past hundred years. And by the way, next year is our hundredth anniversary. I'm going to add just a little bit to this. I know we're on time constraints. But he said, mere words can never adequately describe the many po natural points of beauty in Kentucky. The best of photographs, while better than prose, falls far short of doing justice to the inimitable sculpturing of wind and wave and frost. And nothing, even the inspired hand of genius, spotting in the rainbow colors of the landscape, approaches the realistic. Here's what I want to mention. Here are the natural parks awaiting state custodianship. Their acquisition, their preservation by the Commonwealth constitute a service in which we may all unite with pride and enthusiasm, assured in advance of an appreciative posterity. The first state parks, Pine Mountain, Natural Bridge, Old Fort Herod, and Mr. Chairman, the blue and gray, which was located in Elkton, Kentucky. 
Our mission really hasn't changed over the 100 years. We're still providing a sustainable system of parks. We try to deliver quality programs and amenities. And our goal is to create those memorable experiences and a sense of place, but at the same time, preserve our park's historic and natural integrity and traditions for existing and future generations. Under the leadership of our cabinet over the last hundred years, we have identified and executed through many legislative sessions that have been prioritized and implemented in the Kentucky State Parks. Our vision for Kentucky's park system is to build these public and private partnerships to ensure that state parks bring both recreational and economic value to the communities throughout the Commonwealth. We do want to pursue funding opportunities and continue to address the continuous maintenance needs at each park. Our park staff, they work to protect and conserve Kentucky's natural resources and to be res responsible stewards of what we call the nation's finest. We want to continue to be a leader in the Kentucky's tour tourism industry and more importantly, an economic driver for tourism across the Commonwealth. We want to expand our travel market, become a desired destination for out-of-state travelers, exceed our guest expectations, and continue to complement our park system. Lastly, with this slide, we want to continue to improve facility enhancement initiatives. Kentucky is home to 44 state parks. We have 17 resort parks. 19 recreational parks, eight historic sites. And as the secretary said, we are like a little city. In addition, if you look at the screen, campgrounds, 600 full-time employees, over 2,500 campsites. Kentucky State Park operates on an annual budget of around 110 million. And that is in your report, the proposal that we submitted to Representative Petrie back on December 1st. We rank in the top five of the nation for revenue production. Parks also employs full-time rangers who serve as the park's official law enforcement agency. But the bipartisan investment in Kentucky State Parks is not only critical, but it's timely for ensuring our parks can remain competitive in the tourism and hospitality industries. Your commitment to our parks will allow us to continue modernization efforts by funding essential preservation projects, maintenance, repair, new projects that will continue to position our parks to attract new visitors. Sorry. If you look at the map here today, this is in your proposal as well. And we wanted to bring this to your attention because the gray spots that you see are representing a lot. They represent 55 counties and multiple cities throughout this Commonwealth, providing many jobs and offering opportunities for many guests. See if you can find your spot here. It's often been said that each Kentuckian lives within an hour. Also make note of the two red marks, that's the Dawkins line the Pine Mountain Trail. Therefore, we are tourism drivers. We create jobs. We create places for employment that stimulates our local economies. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I'll continue on with our plan for the 150 million uh, investment. Section 6, 22 RS, House Bill 1, State Parks Improvement reads, the General Assembly recognizes the need to secure the future of Kentucky State Parks for generations to come. To address this need, the project authorization set out in Part 2 Capital Projects Budget of this Act is contingent on the Department of Parks submission and approval by the General Assembly of a comprehensive statewide proposal. As you can see, improvements to customer experiences, 90 million. Physical plant needs improvements, 60 million. Based on the guidelines from House Bill 1, Kentucky State Parks 
created a robust plan to tackle needed upgrades and improvements. Those improvements are as follows, and you can see um, with our proposal here. Campground upgrades, broadband and Wi-Fi upgrades, accommodations upgrades, recreational amenities, building systems improvements, and utility improvements. Camping trends. Camping is a popular leisure time activity that many families have enjoyed for years, but has boomed in interest since the COVID pandemic of 20. According to the KOA 22 North American Camping Report, camping nationally increased 12% or 11.5 million households between 2019 and 2021 from 82.3 million to 93.8 million. Seven out of 10 households have stated that they will most likely participate in camping or glamping as a leisure activity when determining their travel plans. Today's camper is 22% African American, 54% millennials, and 25% with an annual income of 100,000 plus. 50% of new campers want to glamp in camper cabins or yurts. 57% of campers want to try RV camping. Campers are becoming more adventurous, but still prefer the Wi-Fi accessibility. To note, camping is the most profitable revenue generator in the Kentucky State Park system. And the lack of upgraded amenities is holding state parks back on rates and occupancy that could be achieved. In order for Kentucky State Park campgrounds to stay relevant, we need to invest in 50 plus amp electric at all sites, longer site pads, pull through sites, sewer hookups, Wi-Fi, and more camping options. Upgrades will include camping revenue, has grown from 6.1 million in fiscal year 2018 to 7.1 million in fiscal year 22, which is an 18% increase over five years. Commissioner, you have about three minutes to we're going to go to Q&A, okay? We'll work it. We'll Thank work you. it. Yes, sir. Um, Kentucky State Parks estimate an investment of $40 million, which will upgrade approximately 750 campsites, or 37% of the improved inventory, renovate, add bathhouses, add camper cabins. The estimated cost to upgrade one campsite based on the most recent improvements is approximately $20,000. Kentucky State Parks anticipates adding 100 prim primitive camper cabins in various campgrounds at a cost of $35,000 each. The infrastructure upgrades, electric sewer water lines, and bathhouse renovations costs will vary from park to park, but is estimated at $21 million. After the upgrades and improvements <clears throat> are completed, the projected ROI are as follows. Increase per night after improvements, $6 per night, or 18%. Increase in rate, 5% every two years. Campground revenue will exceed $9 million annually. Additional amenities such as camper cabins and yurts will increase parks ROI that will exceed $60 per night, increasing our average rate per night. The benefit to our guests will allow for longer stays, opportunities to enjoy the various recreational and naturalist offerings, within our state parks, and to provide an overall better guest experience. Commissioner? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to shorten this for you uh, as your request. Uh, if you look at broadband and Wi-Fi upgrades, those all are in your proposal. We feel very confident in what we're doing. We spent $4.2 million from the 219 Refresh and the Finest. We continue to concentrate on many of our parks. Our resorts all have Wi-Fi or broadband except one, and we are working on that as we speak. But the information here that you're seeing is also showing in your proposal that we submitted. With accommodations, as you can see, um, our number of lodge rooms, 890, number of cottages, 316, <coughs> our 22 annual budget, 
19.3 million. Average daily rate, 106. And we'll just move to the next slide. Yes. See that as we go. Right, Commissioner, if you would wind us down, and if there's not Let's enough questions, that. we'll come back to the last we couple can of slides. That, okay. that, that sounds good to me. All right. With that said, Ron, you want to just uh, sure. finish this up there? Um, combination upgrades are recreational amenities, which are all in your proposal, showing the magnitude of, of what we need to accomplish over the years. And lastly, we'll get to our utility improvements. That report is inside. It's very extensive on 23 of our parks, also with our wastewater treatments. Right away, some of you've heard about that. We're on top of it, trying to work with our RECC companies. Guest experiences. This is not a part of the 150, but it's something we're taking out of our operating budget that we clearly think will be an opportunity. We don't think, we know it will be. These funds, again, are not a part of the vision with the 150, but it's a part of our vision moving forward. And if you look, Medallia's partnered with Hilton and Marriott, and the list goes on and on. In closing, with the commitment to Kentucky State Park's mission statement, it's evident that the need is there. Over the years, through the identification, evaluations of buildings, it's obvious the physical deterioration is showing from age. Listen, we thank you. I often <clears throat> say to people that someone asked me about Kentucky the other day, Mr. Chairman, and if, uh, if these United States could be called a body, what is Kentucky? It's its heart. Thank you. We're open for questions. Thank you, gentlemen. First of all, we'll go to Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, um, I suspect probably capital projects, capital planning, somebody's got a detailed list of your your uh, proposals. Is there any way that we could get a copy of that? And, and I was wondering if it was in a prioritized list. Yes, we have a prioritized list from last year, but we are working on the one <clears throat> that's due by April, and we have our Director of Financial Operations with us. We'll be able to get that to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very well. Representative Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, Commissioner <coughs> Mayor, we miss you up here. Uh, Russ, I am able to have conversations with Russ on a regular basis, and I'm greatly appreciative. I uh, do have a question. Concerning uh, our parks there in West Kentucky, the two that are closest to me, uh, both Penarol and uh, Lake Barkley there at the lodge. Uh, do we still have any residents there that uh, from from the tornadoes of a year ago? We do not have any residents at the at, at Lake Barkley or Penny Rowell at this time. Another question, please. Uh, as far as those uh, properties right there, how are we on? Uh, those those cabins that uh, and individuals had lived in as far as repairs i know I, there were some issues there with damage how are we coming with those or do we have an idea well as you know we had the fire and then uh it wasn't it was within weeks that the tornado came and hit so we had uh um you know a lot going on at lake barkley not only with that and coming coming out of the tornado um, you know, housing the displaced families, but the structural needs and aging of Lake Barkley. Um, you know, those are those are needs that that this 150 million cannot address everything in in within that park. Which, as Commissioner said, that's that's a city down there. Lake sure. Barkley. It, it's got some ongoing needs that, that we'll have to discuss at later times. Um, but, you know, with with what's going on there and the, and the process of uh, of getting that those rooms, those cottages back up to date, we're continually working on that. And that's a, that is a work in progress. There was damage um, not only from the fire, but from the use, as you know, um, our parks were not built for uh, um, you know, housing uh, full-time, um, you know, housing, which, which we did. And we were grateful to, 
to, to have the opportunity. And I know your communities were grateful that, that we, uh, we supplied that. And uh, the Commonwealth was able to step up and, and help. And Jim, but, I'm uh, going to have to move us on to a couple yeah. more questions here real quick. Thank you. Representative Upchurch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Russ, I want to talk to you just a little bit about uh, Burnside Island. Yes, sir. Dream Big Burnside. And I know that you've uh, recently, or the department has recently issued a um, uh, RFP mm -hmm. uh, for Burnside. And I know we've talked back, I think, in August of last year about you know, the potential for Burnside Island. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Lake Cumberland draws more visitors annually than uh, the Grand Canyon. And the vision locally, uh, I'm not sure matches up with the vision with the department. So I'd like for you to address that. And if you think uh, this, the RFP uh, kind of matches up with what Dream Big Burnside's vision is with Burnside Island, because we've heard talk about uh, this island uh, for years about the potential for, you know, making it a, a destination resort, uh, possibly with a hotel or cabins, a uh, restaurant, uh, to really grow uh, not only that island and the, its potential uh, with all those visitors coming to Lake Cumberland, but, you know, help this, you know, the city of Burnside and, and its endeavors to make uh, Burnside Island that destination resort. And that's the reason the uh, Mayor Lawson created, along with Speed, and if you remember Chris Girdler, former uh, state senator here, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, <clears throat> you know Dream Big Burnside. So I was, I was trying to get your thoughts on, you know, do, does the department's vision parallel with Dream Big Burnside's vision for that? And if not, why not? Let, and make the answer as brief as you can, please. I've got I, one more question, and I got to get us out of I this. I certainly room. will, because I, I believe we have to with an RFP out. And, and on the street, it comes um, due um, for responses on the 27th. After the 27th of this month, you know, I believe we'll be able to sit down and have questions and, and have dialogue on that. Um, but with that said, I've got to keep, I don't mean and, to avoid your And we'll look forward to that question. ongoing dialogue, yes. Commissioner. And, we, yes, and absolutely. certainly won't let that fall off the radar screen, Representative. Right. Appreciate it. Senator Givens. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I, I will be brief, but Representative Upchurch, I think you touched on a point that uh, is, is quite interesting to me because it ties in to some of what you read, Commissioner, out of the budget bill. The budget language, as I read it, the General Assembly recognizes the need to secure the future of Kentucky State Parks for generations to come. To address this need, the project authorization set out in Part 2 is contingent on the submission by the parks and approval by the General Assembly of a comprehensive statewide proposal that shall include the four following things. Recommendations for private and or local government partnerships. Haven't seen that exactly. In your... Number, number two. Okay. Number two. Yes, Detailed financial information regarding return on investment resulting from partnerships. I've seen some ROI information, but I don't know that I've seen it resulting from partnerships. Number three, a 50% match of state contributions from private and or local government partners. Don't know that I've seen a lot of talk about P3s. Number four, you do have a broadband plan. Some folks are asking why the fixed wireless as opposed to a wired plan. But I think, you've, I think you may have checked number four, but I didn't see good solid checks in the boxes on number one, two, and three. We're going to combo answer that, but I can start by if you turn to page nine of the proposal that we submitted, and I'm sure you have that in front of you. Um, we sent a letter out to uh, 65 mayors and county judges across the state um, to start that dialogue within local governments of uh, shared projects that they might be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and you can read that letter. But if I can, Commissioner, okay. just briefly, yes, have you received responses? We have. Okay, because those did not make it into the report that you're referencing. They're, so we, we, we would just like some follow-up on that. And I don't mean to keep interrupting you, you, but I've got to get We can absolutely get you all that, that that we've had since this was set out. It's not in the uh, proposal because we uh, uh, sent this letter out in November. This proposal was due in December. And then uh, – Ron, if you want to. Yeah, very quickly, on. if you turn to page 10, look at the wonderful things that we've created with 
partners across the Commonwealth. Just wanted to mention that to you. Some of those have completed. So, uh, yes, we have reached out to the mayors and the uh, judges, and we can talk to you about some of those responses. Very well. And, gentlemen, as you can see, we're up against other committees, other folks coming in, folks going out. So thank you for your time today. Thank okay. you for your work on this. We'll keep the dialogue going. We do appreciate you very much. With that, we're going to stand adjourned.